Um, she then went to MIT where she did her PhD with John Grotzinger, um, and then a postdoc with Sam Epstein at Caltech before going to UC Davis where she's been for 22 years. 22 years. Um, Dawn started out as a sort of carbonate geologist and then has blossomed uh, into a variety of work on Earth and on Mars. So we're sort of linking our seminar series back from the planetary track we've been on to Earth by somebody who bridges both. Uh, and is going to talk to us about a variety of geological and biological threads we've been working on related to um, oxygen production in the Earth. So, thank you. Don. Yeah, so th thank you. It's, uh, it's really uh, nice to be here. And um, uh, it, is, it is interesting. I treat Earth like a planet, especially when you're going back into uh, Archean times. We have more rocks than we have from any other planet of Archean uh, rocks and way more information. So I'm, I'm also part of the Mars Curiosity rover. And it's, it's amazingly fun and exciting. Uh, but it doesn't allow you to sort of repeatedly go back and, and ask questions and, and get more data. Uh, but one of the questions that I've been interested in for a long time is the origin of oxygen in the atmosphere. So basically about 2.4 billion years ago, we accum Earth accumulated oxygen for the first time. And that basically changed the path of life on Earth. We can't have large organisms living without a large source of energy. And that, that comes uh, from uh, the oxygen. And so as Bob said, I started working on uh, carbonates that were two and a half billion years old before the rise of oxygen. And um, I wasn't particularly interested in biology, but the rocks basically told me that the, the bacteria were influencing the formation of carbonates. It was not skeletal carbonates like um, corals are, are today. And so that sort of started me down this path of sort of how do you actually tell when life, microbial life, is influencing rocks, and how can you use their fossil remnants and their chemical signatures to tell you, to tell you what they're actually doing. And it turns out that um, looking at modern mats in Antarctic lakes has held clues to the origin of oxygen that um, I didn't expect to actually uh, find. So I want to start with a little bit of quick background information on oxygen and mats, and then we'll, we'll go into the meat. So oxygen comes from photosynthesis. There's a little bit of uh, atmospheric production of oxidants and reactions between water and reduced iron and minerals that can produce um, uh, uh, some oxidation, but photosynthesis is the main source. And it, to, for it to accumulate, it has to, the, obviously, the consumption and production have to balance. The groups of organisms that invented oxygenic photosynthesis are cyanobacteria. And since at least 2.4 billion years ago, when we accumulated oxygen in the atmosphere, they've been the primary uh, source of primary productivity. So algae and plants adopted uh, cyanobacteria as endosymbionts and um, can do this process as well. But it originated within the cyanobacteria. There's a lot of controversy ranging over 700 million years to a billion years of when oxygenic photosynthesis evolved. Um, we know that it was the main source of oxidation in the Earth's atmosphere and happened at least 2.4 billion years ago, uh, if not longer. The, f the final thing, which is really key to a lot of what I'm going to talk about, is when you have a microbial mat, which is a dense com community of microbes, they're out of equilibrium with their environment. They change the local chemistry. And um, in particular, I'm going to talk about oxygen production in a microbial mat um, where they're producing the oxygen, but it's very slow to diffuse away. And this is actually one of the problems with biofilms in medical health and things like that, is the chemistry of the biofilm is created by the bacteria that make it, which can lead to, for example, um, bad, bad health outcomes. So usually when people think about oxygen, they think about the whole Earth environment. And this is a, um, a figure modified uh, from Lyons et al. looking at uh, global oxygen production. And the key parts is that at 2.4 billion years old, we have sulfur isotopic signatures older than that 
that require UV radiation to interact with sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere to create uh, a quantum um, isotopic shift between sulfur 33 and 34 and 36 and 34 and 32 uh, that gets preserved in the rock record. And um, to do that, you can't have an ozone layer and you have to have slow redox cycling of sulfur in your sedimentary environment to preserve it. So we have a really nice uh, signature of uh, an oxygenated environment at two, younger than 2.4 billion years ago. Earlier than that, it becomes much more complicated. We don't have any particularly good redox indicators that tell us the global oxidation state, except that we still preserve these sulfur isotopes. Um, and then, as on Earth today, there are a lot of variations in the oxidation state locally. So, for example, even though we have 20% oxygen in the atmosphere, it's pretty easy to go find anoxic sediments. And so, one of the questions is what is actually happening in these uh, local uh, places where a lot of people think there might have been whiffs of oxygen in the atmosphere. I changed the wording to weathering because those are really signatures of oxidative weathering of pyrite um, and not the presence of molecular oxygen. So there, there are sort of two uh, uh, ways uh, that people have argued, uh, in addition to these weathering whiffs, that oxygen was being produced much younger. One is this uh, local increase in oxygen, and the other are um, sort of fossil bubbles within microbial mats. So I'm going to uh, show a model first uh, from Lalonde and Kahnhauser. Uh, where they proposed that you had photosynthesis, particularly on land, in soil crusts and lakes and rivers, that, um, where you had oxygen production to create uh, oxidative weathering on land. Whereas in the marine realm, which is where most people think the oxygen should be produced, it may have been diffuse enough um, that uh, the, oxygen, the oceans would have remained anoxic, and the, and the atmosphere would have remained anoxic as well. Um, and then the other thing is that this is um, uh, just published this last year. Um, uh, Dylan Wilmeth, um, working with Frank Corsetti, looked at lake uh, microbialites that um, were formed in a basin on the, on the 2.7 billion, within the 2.7 billion year old flood basalts um, in South Africa, the Ventersdorp units. And they have good petrographic evidence of both bubbles and iron oxides associated with those bubbles. So I can see if my cursor shows up. So this is a picture of a bubble mold. And down here, there are two more. I zoomed up this picture on the side. Um, there are filaments that are uh, characteristic of cyanobacteria here. And both along this margin and in here, there are iron oxides. So, so Tanya Bozak has had accumulated um, reported evidence of bubbles in, uh, in rocks and found quite a few suggestive ones at 2.7 billion years old. But one of, this is one of the few cases where I think that it's strongly suggestive of oxygen being present and that based on the iron oxides. Other gases that could form bubbles include, for example, methane, and those would not actually produce the oxides that are, that are associated with these particular bubbles. So if we actually do have oxygen uh, being produced, um, possibly, a, I like using the unit of a Phanerozoic, 500 million years or so, uh, before oxygen accumulated in the atmosphere, why did it take so long? Like photosynthesis is super productive. And um, uh, Joe Kirschwink um, is one of the people who've argued that as soon as uh, photosynthesis evolved, it produced so much oxygen, it took over, took over the world. This is where the insights from the Antarctic lakes come from. And I think there's a lot of um, reasons that early oxygenic photosynthesis would have been uh, very inefficient. And I want to talk about some environmental challenges that we've seen in Antarctica, and also some of the genomic challenges that early cyanobacteria uh, might have had. So this is uh, Lake Frixel in Antarctica. Um, it's a desert, and so you have these lakes that are fed by melting 
uh, glacier, mountain glacier, or um, uh, in this case, mountain glacier, sometimes um, parts of the ice cap. And the water balances, the, the um, meltwater flows into the lakes. Um, they have uh, three to seven meters of ice on the top, and they lose water from ablation at the top. Uh, this big brown thing in the middle is a microbial mat that produced enough gas that lifted off the lake floor and got caught in the ice. And the ice freezes from the bottom, ablates off the top, so it, so it came to the surface. So the reason we first started working there is because there are these vast acres and acres of microbial landscapes in these lakes that are getting enough light through the ice that they're photosynthetic, but there's nothing eating them. So a lot of these lakes have a few protists, but there aren't any fish. There's some nematodes, but they're not really any worms. And so it's sort of like going back to Precambrian time when you have a dominantly uh, microbial ecosystem. There are also, because the lakes are ice covered, there aren't any currents or waves. So the water is very still and the sedimentation rates are very, very slow. And so this sort of allows these um, elaborate microbial mats um, uh, to grow. In some lakes, they're being lithified into stromatolites, and in others, they're sort of gelatinous um, and soft. So the way we look at them is uh, there are brave people like my colleague Ian and my former student Tyler who uh, will dive in zero degree water in dry suits. Um, we, so we melt a hole through the ice, and uh, they go down and can do in-situ measurements, uh, take pictures, and, um, and collect samples. And then Anna is uh, one of my colleagues who works a lot with the microbiology and really helped me with that. And, and Devin was one of our, he's a limnologist who is out sampling uh, with us. But this is what we see <laughs> under the lake. So uh, this is a sample. Uh, um, Tyler put a clear tube over this branching stromatolite. Um, and brought it to the surface. And then the other pictures are um, underwater. And each lake is different in terms of the morphology of the stromatolites that uh, grow. And one of our main questions initially was how, how do you get these structures? What causes it? And we have no answers for that at all <laughs> yet, except that there is one set of organisms that tends to make mats flat if they're present. Um, so we still, we still don't know sort of how, how you get these incredible structures. One of the reasons I wanted to know uh, was looking at this. Um, this is the same type of mat. We call them webbed pinnacles. The, the vertical bars are lithified calcite, and then there are these walls and biofilms between them and draping between them. And uh, this is very similar in morphology to some of the Archean microbial structures that I had been studying. So in the fossil, the black is organic matter, and the white is uh, calcites that's filling in voids. And uh, these bacteria have similar voids. They're not created by bubbles in these cases. They're actually created by the growth morphology. So even though we have similar growth patterns across two and a half billion years, they're definitely not the same organisms because everything that's alive today has been evolving uh, through that time. One of my main questions was, were these oxygenic photosynthetic, like cyanobacteria uh, ancestors? If I could go by morphology, I would say yes, uh, but I, I'm not uh, comfortable saying that. However, we can say some things, I think, about uh, the general uh, processes. And so I'm going to talk about Lake Frixel uh, and some of the evidence we have for how oxygen oases are being created. Um, so here are some uh, geochemical uh, gradients in, in Lake Frixel. Um, when the ice freezes, it excludes the atmospheric gases that flow in with the meltwater, and so you end up with very, very high oxygen concentrations at the surface, and those decline with depth. Um, the ice also excludes salts, and so the history of lake level rise and fall uh, produces um, su substantial salinity gradients, so that's represented by the sodium coming down here. That keeps the lake from mixing, and so all the chemical transport in the lake is, is by diffusion. So, for example, you can see that uh, this, this profile on the sulfate at down low um, in the water column, it's being microbially reduced to sulfide. 
uh, which increases, and it's not being mixed in. So it's really interesting right here, you have this redox gradient at uh, almost 10 meters um, that is defined by this balance of light and um, uh, with photosynthesis and, um, uh, and the oxygen. So in Antar because it's Antarctica, there are, half the year is dark and half the year there's light for photosynthesis. And so there are actually cyanobacteria that during the summer can photosynthesize in under this anoxic water, but the overall the year-long accumulation of oxygen is low enough, the, f the flux out of the mat is low enough that you have some hydrogen sulfide still present in the water. And um, when uh, uh, Ian and Tyler uh, were doing a survey of the lake, they saw these changes in the microbial community as you approach this redox gradient and then these green flat mats, which are shown in here, um, are near the limit of photosynthesis. There's some photosynthesis uh, probably slightly lower in the mats. And um, Ian measured the oxygen gradients within those mats. And I'm showing two examples. The top one is at, from a depth where you have approximately atmospheric saturation of oxygen. Um, it's getting uh, a significant amount of light, and you can see that the zero is right at the matte surface, and there's a very strong signature of oxygen um, uh, in the matte that's due to that photosynthesis. When you go down to uh, the depths where oxygen is unmeasurable in the water column, you actually can see it's essentially zero, but you get up to 50 micromoles per liter of oxygen uh, within the mat itself, and it declines uh, with time. So um, we can measure, use the uh, gradients in concentration to measure fluxes. And uh, if you take a flux uh, out of 0.04 micromoles of oxygen per meter squared second, um, for the four months a, a year where this is probably active, you do not have enough flux, flux of oxygen uh, into the overlying water column to, to oxidize the hydrogen sulfide. Um, this was a discovery that wasn't being looked for, and so we didn't, actually have a, we didn't actually have a way to measure the hydrogen sulfide in this environment. We'd really like to go back and study uh, the environments um, some more. So if you, and then you can also calculate the downward flux, and you get a 0.05 uh, micromoles of oxygen of net production, and our net productivity cal uh, calculation based on the amount of chlorophyll that's present and the, the photosynthetic response to light um, plus the photon flux in this environment gives us about the same, the same value for the net productivity. Right. So if we take these ideas, um, we have all mats that are photosynthetic end up with an excess an excess of oxygen uh, within them uh, due to that photosynthesis and it diffuses outward. Um, I didn't point out, but Lake uh, Frixel's temperature is about between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius, so the diffusion is particularly slow. Um, but, it, the, but you also see this excess of oxygen in, in warmer mats as well. In this particular case, the illumination is low and um, you only expect to see uh, this oxygen oasis transiently during the summer. And the environment remains anoxic when that production is low. Um, and the interesting thing is that this 50 micromoles per liter uh, of, of oxygen is about the concentration where you can weather pyrite uh, pretty easily. And so there's enough to actually cause uh, oxidative weathering in this in this this small environment, and so I was working on uh, we were working on that paper at the same time the and Kahnhauser were working on theirs, and so uh, the Frixel environment actually is an example of a place where in a lake uh, you can produce enough oxygen uh, for oxidative weathering. The environment's very different. It was not two degrees Celsius in the Archean. <laughs> it was probably warmer. 
um, and uh, the organisms were different. And so one of, the, one of the key questions, one of the key things about the lower part of Lake Frixel being anoxic is the low photosynthetic rate. If you actually have, where you have higher photosynthetic rates, you produce enough oxygen that you don't maintain um, an anoxic water column. So if you have low, I'll get to the low photosynthetic rates in a minute, but if you have conditions like this, they are something that could produce these whiffs of, of oxidative weathering on the land and the flux of elements uh, to, to the ocean. But you can't, so uh, 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 Lalonde and Kahnhauser have this, uh, a graph that I did not put up here to save your eyes of, of sort of how much, what percent of the continents or Earth would be covered by these mats versus the productivity where you could maintain an anoxic atmosphere and ocean um, while still having oxidative weathering. And the Frixel mats are within, within that range. So then we have this question of sort of what kept oxygen production uh, low uh, if oxygenic photosynthesis evolved hundreds of millions of years uh, before oxidation of the atmosphere. And so this is where I started becoming a biologist, <laughs> in part, a geobiologist, you could say. So, uh, every, so we have oxygenic photosynthesis requires two different photosystems. Um, one uh, that's first in the chain is called photosystem two because it was discovered second, but it's the part that breaks the water into molecular uh, oxygen, uh, hydrogen, and electrons. And then there, and the, the high energy products from that go into photosystem one, which absorbs more light and produces more energy. So some, bio some cyanobacteria can use photosystem one independently of photosystem two. And that photosystem one oxidizes uh, sulfide uh, to sulfate um, in this process. There aren't any known organisms that can only use uh, photosystem two to, to produce oxygen. So in cyanobacteria, these are very tightly coupled, um, but there is a lot of photosynthesis elsewhere within bacteria. Um, so these are uh, the photosynthetic bacteria. They span a large part of the tree uh, the, of, of bacterial relatedness. And um, the organisms that are photosynthetic aren't closely related um, uh, to each other uh, within the bacteria. And so there, there's, but there are similarities in the photosynthetic systems of these different organisms with the cyanobacteria. And that's led to three models of, of evolution. Uh, one is that the earliest bacteria all were photosynthetic and had two photosystems, and most bacteria lost the ability to do photosynthesis. Um, almost most of us do not think that's likely. There are a few com uh, proponents that very strongly push that theory. Uh, I think most of the community thinks that probably uh, photosynthesis evolved and maybe got transferred among a bacteria and at some point one photos photosystem one was transferred probably from the green sulfur bacteria to cyanobacteria. That's the closest uh, photosystem. It's the one, it it uh, oxidizes sulfide. And then another one came uh, uh, photosystem two came from uh, the purple bacteria, and somehow those genes were accepted by the proto, uh, the ancestor of cyanobacteria, and those two photosystems were merged and evolved to produce oxygen. A third model is that cyanobacteria uh, produced all the photosynthetic machinery, and then it was spread across the tree. And um, that is, um, a few people have proposed that, but there's no one pushing this particular model. But in any case, it really looks like sort of the way genetic material is exchanged between organisms is critical to uh, the origin of oxygenic photosynthesis. And it doesn't fit very well with a lot of um, evolutionary models. And it's been really interesting because um, a few years ago, there was a new class of relatives to the cyanobacteria that were recognized um, and called melanobacteria in a paper as of the end of last week. Uh, there's a bunch of renaming. Um, they're now uh, Vampirovibrionia, 
I'll probably end up saying melanobacter because that's the first one that was found. Um, but um, uh, five years ago or so, uh, there were uh, a number of uh, genomes sequenced for, for these bacteria that came out very closely related to cyanobacteria, but there was no evidence that they did photosynthesis at all. They were all heterotrophs and fermenters. And actually, most of them are from uh, animal guts. They seem to be part of our microbiome, so there are probably a lot of these melanobacteria in this room with us uh, today. So, so we have this question. So if you look at, if you look at uh, their environment, obviously in your gut they're not going to be photosynthetic. Um, so is it a bias in sampling? Maybe they, the ancestors were photosynthetic and the ones in the guts lost that ability. Or, or maybe there's something very special happened to allow oxygenic photosynthesis between the, the uh, melanobacteria and the cyanobacteria. So this is where you get really unexpected results from a fishing expedition. <laughs> we weren't fishing. We were, we, were, we were looking at the microbial communities in Lake Vanda uh, through the New Zealand program, which has a lot of work there. And we did this genomic work. And we found um, a lot of organisms that are related to the story of oxygenesis, uh, ox uh, oxygen uh, photosynthesis. So this is like the Dr. Seuss Precambrian landscape. There are hundreds of acres of pinnacles like this. this, this, this these, the one in the middle is uh, about uh, probably 15 or 20 centimeters high. And as a geologist, I like to sample by color, which is also as meaningful for photosynthetic pigments. So this is one that's cut in half. Um, and it turns out that enough light gets into these pinnacles that the, the pink and green are photosynthetic organisms that are producing biomass inside the pinnacle. So they, the brown uh, community of cyanobacteria forms pinnacles, and then uh, the pink and green live inside them and cause them to swell up. Um, but we found a lot of really interesting organisms. So these are the ones that are on that lineage towards cyanobacteria. And uh, the green and whatever this bottom color is are normal cyanobacteria. Uh, the brown right here is uh, some uh, organisms that are uh, basal to it that I'm not going to talk about very much. There's this new blue one, which is a new type, new um, genus of cyanobacteria that I'm going to talk about. And then there's some of these, a lot of these melanobacteria. And the interesting thing about this environment for the melanobacteria is it has a lot of oxygen because of uh, both the photosynthesis and the exclusion of gas from the ice. Um, uh, and it's in a photo, it's in an environment that contains enough light to support cyanobacteria. So I, most of the next work I'm going to talk about is, is produced by my um, uh, postdoc, Christy Grettenberger, um, who can deal with all the, uh, uh, the genomic data. She took all of the 16S sequences from databases that she could find on the cyanobacterial lineage. And so the green down here are all the cyanobacteria. And the one that, that uh, branches off uh, first, the lineage is called the Gloobacter, and then these groups all here are all these Melanobacteria, and uh, there's some other basal groups here. So, so far, as far as we know, we don't know what most of these organisms do, but none of them are known to be photosynthesis except for one of these WPS organisms has a photosystem in it that's not at all like the Cyanobacteria one that probably came in from a lateral gene transfer. The red organisms are ones that we found um, in Lake Vanda. And so in this tree, we sort of have this question is, is non-photosynthesis for all these organisms? And then there's this little space in here that represents difference in 16S sequences, unknown amount of time, where you might have gone from no phototrophy at all to oxygenic photosynthesis. So the Vanda data I'm going to talk about is we have this new basal cyanobacteria, and then we have a couple of new um, of the melanobacteria. So the normally, especially for paleontology where you have body fossils, basically you have 
generations that divide through time. So bacteria, and actually more and more eukaryotes like plants, there's this lateral gene transfer. And so it's really trying to understand the phylogeny or where things come from is difficult, but it's also critically important. So if we look at the 16S ribosomal RNA, which is a marker gene that when you don't have a lot of data, you use, and it's sort of what was built the original bacterial tree. We, can, we, find, we have quite a few examples of aurora in the databases, and the branching lineage pattern would be the division of the melanobacteria from the rest of the cyanobacteria, then the aurora from the globacter and cyanobacteria. So the aurora lineage could preserve some of the ancestral characteristics uh, for all of the cyanobacteria, globacter, and aurora. If we use a lot of genes in the sort of metagenomic model, we get the aurora and the globacter branching off together, separate from the rest of the cyanobacteria. And then the shared traits uh, between the aurora and globacter would mostly say something about this, this lower branch. And this is going to come back when I, when I get to uh, the evolutionary models. Whoa, we're not going that fast. Okay. So, trying to get at some of these questions. The first is, can aurora vandensis, as we're proposing to name, can it do photosynthesis? So we don't have it in the lab. We, can't grow, we haven't tried growing it. Um, it's not something my lab's really set up to do, and growing things that live at small, like single digit Celsius is not conducive for a graduate student project. <laughs> so they have all the genes that are necessary for photosynthesis that we know are required for photosynthesis. It's, it has some uh, genes that stabilize the photosystem two in the membrane that are poorly cons uh, conserved, which means that their sequences are not very similar to what we see in cyanobacteria. Some of those are missing, and then it's missing some uh, light harvesting, harvesting genes. So I'm gonna talk about the light harvesting genes and the stability genes just for a little bit. So for uh, photosystem two, uh, normal cyanobacteria have a diversity of pigments that are arranged in an array to uh, absorb a large amount of light. The pigments are sometimes switched out uh, depending on the wavelengths of light. Uh, Aurora vandensis is missing the types of uh, the, the outer parts of those pigments, um, the phycoerythrin and phycoerythrocyanin. Um, Globobacter is missing the, the PEC genes, but has the PE ones. Um, and then the Globobacter does not have this form of phycobilosome or light harvesting. It has something that's more vertically stacked. We don't know what the structure in Aurora is. You have to have the organism separated to actually image it to see what it is. Um, we predict it will be like uh, the Globobacter. And it is, but it is also, it is missing more of those genes uh, than the Globobacter is. If we look at the stabilizing genes, uh, uh, Globobacter and Aurora are missing some of the same ones. Um, and this is just ovals representing different sorts of enzymes. The key part of the photosynthesis are the parts that host the yellow boxes, which is the path of the electrons through it. And um, the A and the D are the ones that, that actually perform the photosynthesis. So the genes that are missing are the ones that, um, that stabilize the whole structure uh, with, within the membrane. The two that are poorly conserved but present are these O and P, which are very close to the site where the water is oxidized to oxygen. And those are important for controlling the geometry of the uh, uh, oxidation um, site, as well as the chemistry and uh, um, the ionic chemistry there. So um, we don't know that these poorly conserved um, proteins, in fact, the, the P is, it comes out as being related to the, the appropriate gene, but it's so different, we don't know that it, actu that it can actually function that way. So if, if uh, Aurora vandensis can do photosynthesis, 
it doesn't have the normal structure right where that oxidation um, occurs. So we are predicting that it does inefficient photosynthesis. So the absence of those um, stabilizing proteins, um, those proteins are due to, they tend to protect the reaction center from damage, um, from excess light energy, and they improve the probability that if an electron is actually mo removed from water, it goes into the right molecules um, by maintaining like detailed angles and proximities. Um, and then uh, they control the, the O and P control the ionic chemistry uh, near that center to make sure that the electrons are going in, in the right place. So modern cyanobacteria are really good at photosynthesis, but they still have problems with this excess energy breaking the uh, molecular machinery and electrons going in the wrong place sometimes. So they have very rapid um, uh, repair mechanisms. In terms of the pigments, um, we, can, we can't predict as much um, because cyanobacteria do uh, shift the pigments around. But if they really have a restrictive genetic repertoire for pigments, um, they can't um, absorb as many wavelengths of light, and in fact they can't absorb most of the wavelengths of light that they get in their environment. Um, and the structure of the phycobilisome makes it, they're probably not as efficient as absorbing um, that light. And they're missing a few proteins that help transfer light energy uh, to the site of oxygen production. So we now have this question is, are these characteristics that we see related to the ancestral lineage of the aurora, that we can say something about the whole cyanobacterial lineage, like the top diagram or the lower one. And so I'm going to propose three, we're proposing three end member models. Um, one of which is that all the genes that the globobacteria and the cyanobacteria shared were present in the lost Kalman ancestor for the aurora, globobacter, and cyanobacteria. And then the genes that aurora is missing are just, uh, they lost. And, uh, and the cyanobacteria evolved a few more um, that are missing in both the globobacter uh, and aurora. Second model is that you have gene transfer, which we know, has, we know happens. In that case, like all the genes shared by the aurora, globobacter, and cyanobacteria were present, but not the ones that are missing in aurora. And then either the globobacter or cyanobacteria evolved the ones they share, and they transferred them back and forth, and the cyanobacteria evolved more. These are the two cases if, uh, these are two end member models if the aurora and globobacter branched from an ancestral lineage. If you have uh, a shared ancestor for all three, you could just have sort of progressive evolution of additional genes and increasing uh, efficiency of photosynthesis without requiring gene loss or gene transfer. Um, I prefer this model. Christy prefers this model because it makes sense. But uh, we do have the issue that we know lateral gene transfer occurred because there's no evidence of photosynthesis in the melanobacteria. So these genes that the aurora cyanobacteria and globobacter share came for the photosystems had to come from somewhere else. Um, and so that sort of gets us to these, these new melanobacteria. And this part is super short. Uh, out of all these organisms, <laughs> the red organisms, the Joint Genome Institute, which is one of the, which is what emerged from sequencing the human genome, uh, gave us a, a bunch of samples, deep metagenomic sampling. And out of that, we only got three uh, organisms that we could identify. Um, and they're all within this one group of melanobacteria. <laughs> And MAGS stands for metagenome assembled genome, or metagenomic assembled genome. And so we have a bunch of samples uh, that have uh, the same organism in them. Um, and it's related to one that's previously known. The one that's previously known was from a um, uh, uh, waste treatment plant and designed to extract um, uh, nutrients. And so ours are. Uh, uh, similar, but from a, a natural, illuminated, low-nutrient uh, environment. So um, 
basically, we, the surface of these pinnacles we don't think goes, we think uh, stay oxic all year round uh, based on water chemistry that's been measured over winter. The, the interior part that's not photosynthetically active uh, could go anoxic over wi winter. Um, but even though we have organisms that could be in an environment where they could do photosynthesis, there's no genes at all related to photosynthesis in these organisms. And that really supports the lateral transfer of photosystems to the an cyanobacteria ancestors. Um, and then there's some additional work I'm not going to talk about with aerobic respiration and the use of oxygen. Um, and uh, Rochelle Su uh, just uh, published uh, last week. Well, it's not even, it's an it's a, uh, accepted article. It's not um, officially published yet. Uh, but they um, uh, show that it looks like aerobic respiration started it, or, uh, in melanobacteria is related to lateral gene transfer as well, that that was not part of the common ancestor. Um, but Christie has found some genes related to that that are sh in, the, in these melanobacteria that are shared with the cyanobacteria. So there's, there's a lot of complicated gene exchange and evolution um, going on. So coming back to this, at the base of cyanobacteria, we're predicting inefficient uh, phototrophy in the modern organism. It's still been evolving for billions of years. Uh, but we think it may uh, record some traits of the, the shared ancestor, uh, for sure with the Globacter, possibly also with the oxyphotobacteria, or the cyanobacteria. That's a nomenclature thing again. And we have a little bit more evidence that there's no phototrophy in the related organisms. So this gets to some of the insights um, uh, that I think combining the geologic, environmental, and genomic evidence, it, uh, it really seems unlikely that the photosystems evolved within the cyanobacteria. Um, or that they were entirely lost by the melanobacteria. So this strongly supports the, the favored model for most people is that oxygenic photosynthesis started with a lateral transfer of two whole gene systems into, into a non-photosynthetic organism. Whether this happened simultaneously or one than the other is not known, and these represent um, hundreds of genes that all have to be present for it to work. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really sort of different evolutionary concept for how you create uh, an innovation. Once those are transferred into the ancestor of the cyanobacteria, evolution had to integrate them into the cell processes and link the two photosystems <laughs> in a way that creates this, this breaking of water. And that, that is something that is sort of very uh, difficult for, to, it's, it's like one of those questions like the origin of eukaryotic cells. We have evidence that things must have happened, but actually the, the, um, the mechanisms that, that allowed them and the processes that cells went through um, are, uh, sort of very, cr need to be very creatively uh, speculated on. And then we have to figure out ways to test this. And ideally, we'd find some organism that just had, in that cyanobacterial lineage, that just has one photosystem, or it has two, but they're not linked. Or as uh, Woody Fisher at Caltech has proposed, that, that before the organisms could break water into oxygen, they oxidize manganese. Um, and then, so if we found an organism that uh, photosynthetically oxidized manganese, that, that would be very helpful. Um, I'm proposing that oxygenic photosynthesis initially was very fragile. Um, a lot of the genes that stabilize the photosystems in the membrane um, uh, are not present in other photosynthetic organisms. They're part of that process of integrating these lateral gene exchange um, into the organism. I also think that, that photo inhibition um, is, was likely a big problem. So the, the capture of light energy is very risky for the photosystem. The, that energy has to be controlled so it doesn't actually break the photosynthetic 
mechanism. So if you actually look, there's cyanobacteria that grow, like uh, at UC Davis, we have all this crushed gravel where we park bikes, and there, there are cyanobacteria that live in it, and they're always black because they produce a lot of carotenoids and extra pigments um, because there's too much light for their photosystems. Um, and that's for like hefty uh, cyanobacteria. We're, one of the reasons we might find some of these organisms in the Antarctic lakes is because they're very cold, so the excess energy is more likely to, you can absorb more excess energy by the water, uh, and it quenches the motion of the molecules uh, faster, which, which helps um, uh, with the stabilization of the photosystems. And then they're also very dark. And so if you have inefficient uh, phototrophy, it could be that only, you can only persist and maintain your photosystems if you have a very low light flux until you've evolved the mechanisms to repair the, the photosystems quite quickly. So then the next step is that once evolution, I, evolution stabilized the photosystems, which, which could have happened quite quickly because of the, the strong evolutionary pressure to do it better, then, you can, then the organisms can start evolving new pigments to absorb more light if they're not as sensitive to the photo inhibition. If the cyanobacteria were initially restricted to low light environments, they could have expanded uh, into new ecosystems, and as they're more efficient, the productivity increases, and thus the oxygen fluxes um, increase. And so the idea is that that evolutionary stabilization led eventually to the large enough flux of oxygen to actually then start meaningfully um, oxidize the iron and sulfur um, and uh, manganese and other reducing components in the environment and eventually allowing it to accumulate um, in the atmosphere. So, so in my view, from uh, the sort of the a conceptual model for the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis, it, sure, it could take hundreds of millions of years. We really don't know how fast that could proceed, but it is reasonable to me that at 2.7 billion year old, years ago, you could have been producing bubbles of oxygen in a mat um, that, uh, that uh, produced some oxidative weathering, but it took a long time to act for that photosynthesis to actually become a viable enough metabolism to, to actually change uh, the chemistry of the surface of the Earth. So those are my conclusions and insights, and I would love to answer some questions. I should say, is the field work takes a lot of funding. The genomics takes a lot of funding, and it is really fun collaborative science. So thank you. So a question. So I'll, I'll start off with one. Okay. Um, why did these organisms survive? Like, well, I, I get why the evolutionary story, but why, why, how, how do you get these inefficient photosynthesizers surviving in close proximity to efficient photosynthesizers? Right, so, so this, is, this is one of the things that I struggled with a lot, because evolution is framed in terms of competition. But and it's usually framed in terms of the more organisms you have, the better off something is. To, to make a bacterial strain go extinct <laughs> means that it, the com if it's a competition-derived thing, it means that there's so much competition, it can't survive anywhere on Earth, right? And so, so in some sense, uh, organisms can pers microorganisms in particular, can persist for billions of years with some slow amount of evolution because they don't require very much. But, so, so I was, I, more specifically, in the, in the map, mm -hmm. like you have well, why, why, why is it, do these organisms seem to be doing competitive, comparatively better, like in the, it was in their pink area, compared to other cyanobacteria that have all of the stabilization mechanisms? Right, right. So, um, I'm not sure that they're doing better, as opposed to there are a lot of cyanobacteria that can't survive there, right? So, to get to these lakes, you, the, or, the organisms have to be able to survive freeze drying and the terrestrial environment, radiation environment, to get to the lakes to grow, 
right? And and the thing the thing is when you're actually looking at a pinnacle like this, there there are ecological differences. So the um, the concentration of the melanobacteria is more in the interior where there is a lot less light. They can do fermentation and heterotrophy, and so they might not, the melanobacteria are not photosynthetic. So they're eating some waste product, um, right? And so then the aurora are in this environment, and it, and it, and that that space is not entirely filled by cyanobacteria. A lot of it is just organic matter in the substrate. And they they have a moderate diversity of cyanobacteria. It's not high, right? But this it gets to the point that that I'm not sure it's competition, right? That's that's determining the community structure. It, it can just be what colonizes there and and the the growth rate that the organisms can do. And it could be that where it's cold and fairly dark, their growth rate is higher because they're not getting as much damage. It's not, it's not clear to me, they're, and they're absorbing a wavelength of light that the other organisms tend not to based on their, their pigment genes. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of having to move away from this idea that community is structured by competition as opposed to communities being structured in collaboration. So they're going after a little bit different of the spectrum. So they, ha they have some niche that's not overlapping with if, We don't know what they're, we, we, we would love to know what they look like and where they are. We don't know, for sure. Yeah. Um, does that mean that by just going to these environments that you could actually influence what the concentrations of bacteria in these, uh, in these mats? So if you went back a year later, would you see different percentages and different, maybe even altogether new bacteria that you guys may have introduced by going to these hard to um, Right, so, so uh, we are worried about that and um, we have not influenced them. So the Lake Vanda in particular has been, uh, the first time it was sampled was in uh, I think 1990 and before a lot of the genomics work came, but people looked at the filaments with microscopes and they have the same morphology of filaments they, they do now. So, and also um, people don't, unless you're taking samples, don't tend to take cyanobacteria uh, with us. And almost all the bacteria that are part of our microbiome do not do well and are not competitive at four degrees Celsius and lower. So in fact, the early explorer, we take out all our waste, the early explorers poop behind a rock. <laughs> and um, people have studied those organisms and unless the, all, almost all the human induced bacteria are gone unless they form cysts and they're taken over by Antarctic adapted organisms. But that's because like it's out on the surface and it has to survive freeze, freeze drying. So whenever it gets warm and slightly moist, the Antarctic bacteria grow, but the human ones can't. We, we did, so the top of the food chain in one of the lakes is a copepod we discovered, and we were very worried that, that it had been introduced by limnologists. Um, but it turns out it's an evolutionarily different uh, organism than any of the lakes that anyone studied the copepods for. And the reproductive rates are so low compared to the population we saw that we don't think it was. But, but it's, there, there's some lakes that are closed to diving completely. Um, it is one of those, with a lot of biology, it's one of these difficult questions about the balance between preservation and study. It's the lakes we go to, we're more careful than the early explorers were. And, yeah. Hey, Paul. Uh, I have two questions. Well, what is a common first? Um, photosystem one and photosystem two almost certainly evolved in a single complex system. So structurally, they both have Yes. Yeah. Membrane yeah. spans. Yep. Yeah. So the structure you cannot find in sequence land anymore. The relationship. It's in structure. Yeah. And yeah. Four of that. I'm just for just because we have the protein data bank down yeah. the street and we look at these structures a lot. Yeah. The four is a Rossman fold, and it doesn't matter. It's a it's a beta alpha beta sheet mm -hmm. in the center. And 
and since both photos are right. and so the right. strong argument that they came from a single common ancestor yes. that he diverged to the two yes. PS1 and PS2. Yes. And across the tree in different versions of PS1 exactly. and PS2. Yes, yes, I agree completely. So yep. then the next question, or the next comment, is certainly photosystem 2 is most closely related to the purple non sulfur bacteria. Mm -hmm. And the purple non sulfur bacteria favorite substrate is hydrogen. Right. And the green sulfur bacteria, which is Dr. Photosystem 1 type 4, their favorite substrate is H2S. Right. So if you go to, for example, um, the Black Sea, at the interface of the, where exactly you have the H2S coming up and the oxygen mm -hmm. coming down, you have that mm -hmm. hole. Yep. That's exactly where the green sulfur bacteria lives. So right. you have these anoxygenic photosynthetic organisms in these lakes. No. We don't. We don't. No. So that's why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so in Lake Frixel, there are a few chemoautotrophs, but there are no... There's no, like, we might have gotten, like, there's no significant population of anoxygenic phototroph in the lakes. That's surprising. Yeah, yeah. So my student, uh, Megan Dillon, is, uh, just resubmitted a paper on the ecology and the organisms in Frixel from metagenomic work. And they, yes, it is surprising. So normally, to my knowledge, cyanobacteria are kept under anaerobic conditions Mm -hmm. um, that's an old, old work that was done mm -hmm. in the solar lake in Israel. Mm -hmm. um, but then the question that is more profound to me in a way is where does the nitrogen come from? What's the nitrogen cycle? So um, my st uh, one of my second year grad students who's about to take her QE exam is, is working on that, is going to work on that. So interestingly, this is a really big problem, which is why I was hoping to have a little bit more time to talk with you. But we can do it. Uh, let me pull up the gradient. Uh, or, uh, let's see, where are we here? Um, there are no genes for fixing nitrogen in Lake Frixel in the metagenomes, irrespective of organisms in the oxygenic part of the lake. Frixel is supposed to be nitrogen limited as opposed to phosphorus. The band is supposed to be phosphorus limited versus nitrogen, although it has some nitrogen in lipids, um, which suggests that. But um, the, when you get down right to the, um, the, uh, the oxycline, there are uh, cyanobacteria-like genes, I, we haven't been them out, that um, have nitrogen fixation, but there's also more ammonia and nitrate in the water column there, and there's almost none in the water column above that. And then the, the, the primary productivity and the biomass is much lower where you have the nitrogen availability. So, so we don't know how the, the, the community is get, meeting its nitrogen needs where in the oxygenic part of the lake. So you're asking about why is there a 500 in your gap? It's a very, you're in a very dangerous situation if you have an oxycline and an H2S. Right there, you denitrify everything. Mm -hmm. And that's probably happened several times in the history of at least the pores that we had from Agarone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you try to get up to get oxygen, and then there's a feedback, a negative feedback that pushes you into an anoxic world because mm -hmm. you don't have fixed nitrogen, and you have to do that again over millions of years. It seems. It seems. Right. So those are the whiffs, if you will, of the nitrogen isotopes. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you do not have nitrogen isotope data for, the, for anything, right? Uh, no. Um, we have samples that Sydney uh, is separating out the organic matter for, or just did some tests for the concentrations, and so in a month, she's hoping before her qualifying exam that she has some nitrogen isotope data. And we're really interested in whether it's homogeneous isotopes or heterogeneous to try to get at some of the processes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. I'm wondering if there were lakes during the Archean. There were. And whether or not you think that oxygenic photosynthesis originated on land. 
Right. So the the example of bubbles, I sh I told you about. I was so happy that Frank Corsetti uh, <laughs> talked about these bubbles. Examples of bubbles are in lake deposits on the Ventersdorp flood basalts. And so I think at 2.7 billion years old, you had oxygenic photosynthesis in lakes. So I don't know if it originated in those environments or not. There's been some ancestral character reconstruction among the cyanobacteria. Um, I can't remember her name right now, but it's a paper that's a, almost a decade uh, old now that suggests that the cyanobacteria did first proliferate in fresh water. The, 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 I'm not convinced by those, um, uh, the, the ancestral reconstruction, because it's a very complicated sort of process. But, but I do think that, that it was present on land 2.7 billion years ago. And um, I think it's easier to demonstrate that you had oxygenic photosynthesis in lakes than the oceans, because lakes are smaller bodies of water. Um, and it's just easier for a microbial community to change the chemistry of a lake and uh, those characteristics than it is for the ocean. So I think it's easier to preserve in lakes, which is why I kept talking, someone should go look in these lakes, <laughs> which luckily Dylan and, and, uh, and Frank did. Um, and so I think that there's a lot more potential to look. It's really hard to prove something's a lake or the ocean, but when you're dealing with uh, sediments between flood basalt units, that's a little bit easier. So I think there's, there's hope to, to keep tracking that back. Uh, it doesn't say that that's where cyanobacteria emerged, but it does suggest that they were on land early. Yes, there is still organic carbon, and I don't know if Dylan measured those or not. I, I, I could ask and see. No. Yeah. Uh, how thick are these mats? Also, yeah. how fragile are these chemicals themselves? Do they live like very separately? Do you weight around? Do you still have to test them? Yeah, so um, these ones are the, are, uh, like, you can't really bend them. These, these, they're unlithified, but they're a lot like stiff jello. <laughs> and so um, there's a little bit of, of um, mud and some sand comes through the ice in them, but this is the vast majority is organic matter. Um, but like you can use scissors to cut them, <laughs> and this, even though they're maybe that big around, so they, they're and they still hold their integrity. Um, in the interior, once you no longer have active photosynthesis and you have decay, then it's a little fluffier and, and flakes flakes apart. Um, so. Um, when the, the lake levels are going up due to climate change and more meltwater, and so the mats first initiate um, on the on glacial debris, so sand and boulders, from sand to boulders, and then in deeper parts of Lake Vanda that have been uh, growing for uh, hundreds of years, we, we, have, we have cores that are maybe a meter thick. Um, and then what you, you have going down is just sort of this mush of organic matter with some mud and some sand grains. And so uh, you can't quite see the lamination in here, but the high seasonality gives us annual laminations that you can count. And so um, a, lot of the, a lot of the pinnacles are on the order of several decades old. Um, but, but once we sort of get into the thick organic goo at the bottom, it's, it probably represents hundreds of years. Yeah. Right, so we haven't seen correlations with the amount of light or temperature. Um, it, it seems that the more complicated structures are present where we have a lower sedimentation rate because the sediment especially mud coming in, tends to uh, compact pinnacles um, and keep them going down, uh, keep them from growing. We, we don't know why you end up, let me go up, uh, that's a long ways. You don't, we don't know really why 
for example, like Vanda has structures like this and like Joyce has structures like this. Both of these are complicated structures because the sedimentation rate is really low. Uh, Lake Untersea, um, these are giant cones. These are little pinnacles that are simpler than these other two, but similar. Where you have this dark purple organism, it's a thicker cyanobacteria, it tends to flatten things out. And so we have, we do know that if this, this, like it's not all the same species of bacteria, but if you have these thick purple filaments, you don't get the pinnacles. So we, it would, I would really like to know, and this, and this has some calcite in it, which uh, the, the mineral precipitation might have something to do with it as well. But, but it's, it's a really interesting problem that w when we, we've done some genomic analyses looking to see if the different components have different organisms and they aren't statistically significantly different. So it's, it's, one, of, it's one, of sort of my fundamental questions I've been asking about this and, and I don't know how to get the answer. I thought we would just find the answer being the organisms, but that's not the case. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys.